Hello dear Tech Dent community. Welcome to another video where we help you learn how to understand your dental health better and provide actionable tips. Have you ever stared at an OPG x-ray and thought, what on earth am I looking at? Well, fear not. Today, we're diving deep into the fascinating world of panoramic x-rays, your secret weapon in uncovering hidden dental secrets. Get ready to unravel the insights behind these images and learn how to spot important patterns that could save you from potential problems down the road. Let's unlock the art of reading OPG x-rays together and take your dental skills to the next level with Dr. Yaroslav Belsky. Hello, dear Czech Dent community. When we say OPG x-rays, this is what it looks like, a full mouth panoramic x-ray. Did you know that how your head is positioned can dramatically affect the results we see? That's right. So. Let's make sure your head is in the right position to get the most accurate insights into your dental health. When we capture a panoramic x-ray, symmetry in your dental structure can be interpreted as normal variations, but those asymmetrical changes are the ones that demand our full attention. Let's start with understanding the different regions using a healthy patient's x-ray. Let's see what we can see in the periphery. Here you can see the spine, the styloid process, the external auditory canal, and the hyoid bone. In addition, we have a number of superimposition effects here in the periphery that can sometimes be interesting. Here you can see the back wall of the pharynx, and this structure is the pharynx itself. In the case of malignant tumors, calcifications or other radiological changes can be visible in this region. This area is the soft palate, which then merges into the root of the tongue. Now let's look at the lower jaw. Let's explore the features of the mandible, where you'll notice the two condylar processes and the two coronoid processes. These structures play crucial roles in jaw movement and functionality. Now, let's see the canalis mandibuli. This vital canal carries the alveolar nerve, entering the jaw through the foramen mandibuli and exiting via the foramen mentale. It's important to understand this anatomy, especially for those who may experience discomfort during dental procedures after receiving local anesthetics. Imagine having a foramen mandibuli that's set further back. This might result in the anesthetic not reaching the nerve effectively, leading to a less than ideal experience. So make sure you pay close attention to your injection sites. As we dive deeper into the anatomy, we find the nervous alveolaris. This nerve usually emerges from the canalis alveolaris with a distinctive loop that travels towards the abdomen. That's ventral if you're keeping track. This is particularly critical when considering dental implants. Always keep this anatomy in mind and discuss this before procedures to ensure a successful procedure. And here's a crucial tip. When planning your implant placement, make sure you maintain at least a five millimeter safety distance from the foramen mentale. This precaution is essential to avoid any nerve injury during implantation and ensure safe procedure. Lastly, let's not forget to examine the thickness of the basal compacta on the lower jaw, marked by the white line you see here. This thickness often provides essential insights into bone quality, which is a key factor in successful dental implant procedures. Here we see the linear oblique and the buccinator Christ. Here's a cool tip. If a surgeon makes a precise incision in the retromolar trigon during a wisdom tooth removal and follows along the ascending branch just below the buccinator Christ, you're likely to experience much less swelling post-operation. As we journey through the middle face, check out the anterior nasal spine and the nasal septum. Have you ever been through having pesky polyps in the maxillary sinus? If any dental causes have been eliminated, I always keep an eye out for nasal septum curvature. It could be a sign of a rhinogenic issue. Understanding this connection can be a lifesaver. Now let's zoom into the nose. Here, the inferior nasal concha is beside the ethmoid cells, while just nearby, you'll find the maxillary sinus. Fun fact, the maxillary sinus floor often has these quirky little septa known as underwood septa. If you're planning a sinus lift, these guys are worth keeping an eye on. Here, don't confuse the back wall of the maxillary sinus with this line. That's merely a projection of the cheekbone, often referred to as the linea innominata. We also have the tuber maxillae region here, which extends into the fossae pterygopalatinus. This is where the magic happens, as vital vessels of the skull reside. 
At the top, the maxillary sinus is limited by the eye socket, the infraorbital wall. You can see the infraorbital canal here, which leads the infraorbital nerve. This is where the conduction anesthesia is used, example, during sinus lift operations. Lastly, notice this line representing the hard palate. Sometimes it can trick the eye by casting a shadow due to air spaces. If the patient doesn't press their tongue against the palate when the image is taken, it's like a little optical illusion. Now that we have understood the different areas in the x-ray, we will now dive deeper into a few pathological peculiarities. Let's start with this x-ray first. Here in this x-ray we can see a few root remnants with a dental focus, a so-called chronic apical periodontitis. You can also see a reaction of the maxillary sinus mucosa due to the dental focus. In addition, we of course also have caries, jaw atrophy and other findings that we will not go into in detail now. In this second x-ray too, you can clearly see the swelling of the maxillary sinus mucosa on the left, a so-called odontogenic polyp that could have grown due to this incomplete root treatment. In this third x-ray too, we have a mucosal reaction of the maxillary sinus due to a dental focus, chronic apical periodontitis due to an incomplete root treatment. Here in this fourth x-ray, you can see a radicular cyst on the mesial root. In comparison, there is a chronic apical periodontitis of the distal root. Here in this fifth x-ray, we have a radicular cyst on tooth 13. The bone in region 13 is sometimes very thin, which can look like a cyst. A small image x-ray can bring clarity. What is striking about this x-ray is that the face looks very narrow. The patient was standing too far forward in relation to the plane of the face. In this x-ray, the head looks very wide. The patient was standing too far back. This sixth x-ray is interesting because we see an artifact from an improperly fitted lead apron. The apron should cover the back as radiation exposure is greatest there. What is also interesting in these patients is the powerful compactor of the lower jaw. In these patients we see a reaction of the maxillary sinus mucosa on both sides. These are the curved structures. Here we have a dental sinusitis on both sides. If the findings are uncertain, a DVT can be done. Here too, a subtle dental sinusitis can be seen, as well as a retained canine. This is a compound odontoma. In a compound odontoma, the tooth parts are not as well developed as in a complex odontoma. The complex odontoma looks more like a tooth. This structure is simply tartar. In addition, we have an unresponsive root residue and an amalgam tattoo and a cementoma. This patient was treated for trigeminal neuralgia for years, although the nature of the pain did not correspond at all to trigeminal neuralgia. This was a hedgehog syndrome. Here, the ossification of the stylohyoid ligament up to the hyoid bone is clearly visible. Such findings are often seen in x-rays, but the patients are completely free of symptoms. This patient had severe pain when swallowing and in certain head positions. Here, osteosclerosis on the right and an unresponsive foreign body in the bone. Finally, a few x-rays of the jaw joint. We have clear grinding facets on the left, not as pronounced as on the right. However, the patient is completely free of symptoms. In addition, there is chronic apical periodontitis. Here too, there are clear remodeling processes in the jaw joint. The jaw joint gap has disappeared and is no longer visible. The jaw joint head has resorbed, but this patient was also completely free of symptoms. In such cases, one should not speak of temporomandibular joint arthrosis, as this only worries the patient unnecessarily. Such findings often involve clenching and grinding. In this patient too, there are clear remodeling processes in the jaw joint, and this patient is also completely free of symptoms. In the last picture, we see osteomyelitis in 236 and reactive cementum formation in the root, clearly visible in this picture. Although the x-ray is a play of shadow and light, if you know in advance what you are looking for, it can provide a lot of valuable information in everyday clinical practice. Thank you for watching this video. Hope you can now understand your x-rays better and have better conversations with your dentist. Learn more about your x-rays with the help of our AI and expert dentist consultations. Head to checkdent.com for instant report.